great pleasure to be able to introduce the Honourable Peter Dutton, MP, Minister for Defence. Uh, Peter Dutton will also be bringing up 20 years. Seems everyone's been doing 20 years uh, in either in Parliament or the public service, but uh, 20 years in the Parliament later this year. He came into the Defence Ministry just over two months ago, but with deep experience in the security establishment, uh, he hasn't wasted any time in bringing to bear a singular focus on Defence's core mission, to protect Australia's national security interests. This focus is critical as our strategic environment continues to shift and deteriorate and the need for clear-eyed decision-making is paramount. Minister, thank you for taking the time to address the ASPE conference today. You're already making a, a real difference in terms of building confidence in the ADF and in reminding the nation of the critical role of our, that the, our Defence Force plays. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Minister Dutton, uh, Minister for Defence, to deliver his remarks, and then Peter Jennings will join in the discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much. It's a <clears throat> pleasure to be back at ASPE and uh, for the first time in my capacity as uh, Minister for Defence. Thank you very much uh, to Peter Jennings and to your leadership of uh, this organisation. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge all of the many ADF departmental industry diplomatic representatives uh, who are in attendance today. Uh, you are all here as I am because you recognise the great value of ASPE. ASPE continues to produce informed and incisive and independent analysis on all things defence and national security. And as our nation contends with a more challenging strategic environment, it is more important than ever that we have a frank and nuanced discussion with the Australian people about the threats that we face. We cannot simply seek to ring fence Australia from, compl from complex and difficult issues and ASPE will continue to play an important role in this national discussion. Today, our region in the Indo-Pacific is far more complex and far less predictable than at any time since the Second World War. That's due to a number of factors, as we know, intensified strategic competition, particularly between the major powers of China and the United States, nations modernising and building up their militaries, the emergence of new and disruptive technologies which are changing the nature of warfare, and the increased prevalence of so-called grey zone activities, which fall short of armed conflict, but nonetheless are designed to irritate, to intimidate and to injure other countries, including our own. These include the use of tactics like cyber attacks, economic coercion, financial disruption, trade interference, campaigns of disinformation, the use of paramilitary forces and the militarisation of disputed features. It should go without saying that the Australian government's first priority is to maintain peace in our region, and that will always be our first priority. All countries in the Indo-Pacific have a shared interest in ensuring continued stability and prosperity. The unfortunate fact, of course, is that not all nations are acting in a manner consistent with these goals. And the stakes are being raised exponentially through the rapid build-up of military capability. Increasingly prosperous Indo-Pacific countries are investing heavily in increasing the range, the sophistication and the precision of their capabilities. And it's expected that by 2035, at least half of the world's most advanced combat aircraft will be operating in this region. More than half of the world's 470 in-service submarines are already operating in the Indo-Pacific waters. New maritime surveillance and anti-access and area denial technologies will further complicate the strategic environment. As a consequence, the prospect of military conflict is less remote than in the past, especially through miscalculation or misunderstanding. So what we must do as a nation is, of course, to prepare for whatever may be on or below the horizon. We must be prepared for any contingency, and that preparation includes making sure that our Australian Defence Force is well-trained and well-equipped. And that, as you know, is what we're doing by restoring defence spending to over 2% of GDP. It is critical in this environment that defence gets on with its core business. The core business is articulated in the 2020 Defence Strategic Update, and it's reflected in the three objectives. To shape Australia's strategic environment, to deter actions against our nation's interests, and to respond with credible military force when required. For the last two decades, for a number of reasons, the majority of our forces have, of course, been deployed 
outside of our immediate region. As the geopolitical landscape has shifted, we must sharpen our strategic focus and redouble our efforts in the Indo-Pacific. It's critical that like-minded neighbours rally together around the goals of prosperity and sovereignty. The Australian Government is stepping up its engagement with our Pacific partners, and we're working even more closely, as you know, with our allies and our friends. These include our Five Eyes partners, NATO, the Quad and ASEAN, and European countries like France, who are taking a much greater interest in our part of the world. So we are working to shape the region together, a region where nations big and small have their sovereignty respected, a region where interactions are governed by the rule of law, not by manipulation or coercion. We're also working to deter actors from taking aggressive actions against our nation's interests. The government's investing $270 billion over the decade in defence capabilities that will support the ADF across both traditional and evolving domains. Effective deterrence is important in ensuring those who seek to threaten our national interests are made to think twice before doing so. An important element of this is achieved through creating capabilities to hold a potential adversaries, forces and infrastructure at risk from a greater distance. So the government is investing in, for example, long range strike weapons, offensive and defensive cyber and area denial systems. One of my first acts as minister was to jointly announce that the government would accelerate the establishment of a sovereign guided weapons enterprise to the value of a billion dollars. It's a new military manufacturing industry, one which will, according to industry estimates, uh, be worth about $40 billion in local production and export opportunity over the next two decades. It's an example of how we can grow our defence industrial base and our sovereign capabilities and how our national security and economic developments are truly entwined. Of course, core to deterrence is our alliance with the United States of America, which this year celebrates its 70th anniversary. Australia is taking greater responsibility for our own security by growing the ADF's self-reliant ability to deliver deterrent effects. Our aim is to become an even more effective alliance partner. We're achieving this through our industrial and technology sectors, through forced posture initiatives and through defence diplomacy. In addition to deterrence, the ADF needs to be able to respond with credible military force when required. And the strategic update points to the suite of core capabilities the government continues to invest in. These include the Joint Strike Fighters, the Arafura-class offshore patrol vessels and boxer combat reconnaissance vehicles. Our attack-class submarines and anti-submarine hunter-class frigates will be critical assets in what is becoming a more complex and congested underwater battle space. Continued investment in defence is essential to building a sovereign industry that is more capable of sustaining the ADF as a cutting edge force. Eight out of 10 industry and implementation plans have now been released for sovereign industrial capability priorities. And in the last year alone, more than 60 new capability proposals have been uh, proposed uh, or approved. So Peter, uh, in closing, uh, we do need to make sure that the development of military capabilities today is far more complex a process than it was even 20 years ago. That's a consequence of rapidly evolving technologies and the need to integrate capabilities across the battle space for interoperabil interoperability and the sheer number of platforms and systems. That said, I've been clear in my view that the government and the Australian people expect commitments to be met and where issues arise, they need to be dealt with. We must do everything we can to put the ADF in the strongest possible position in what is a very, very uncertain time. We owe it to the men and women of the ADF to give them the tools and resources they need to get on with their job and to keep both themselves and our country safe. So thank you so much for the opportunity of being here with you today. And I think we're moving into a Q&A session now. It's the more exciting part, perhaps. We'll <laughs> thank see. You. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, Peter, thank you so much. And uh, I should say it's also great to see you here in person. Uh, we, we were uh, having to uh, 
uh, possibly talk to you remotely at one stage, but it's, it's uh, fantastic that, that you're here in Canberra. Not quite 100 days. Um, I think you're about 70 days at this stage of your time as minister, but you've managed to get around the country, go to some bases, talk to lots of people inside uh, and outside the defence organisation. Having done that, what's your um, initial impressions of the things that government most urgently needs to do? You sure it's only 70 days? Feels like <laughs> much longer. Probably for some others, it feels like a long, lot longer as well. Uh, uh, look, my, my sense is that we uh, are seeing the debate mature in Australia in terms of what is the reality that we're confronting in the Indo-Pacific. I think there's a reality within the public's mind. I think there's a crystallising of that within uh, the minds of uh, strategic thinkers, both in defence and across government otherwise. And I think that gives rise to uh, a cultural reform and uh, a maturing and moving into a different space uh, than what we have. So I, I have been impressed uh, around the NSC table over the last six years with what I've seen out of defence and I'm uh, obviously equally impressed with what I've seen coming into it. But uh, we, we are pivoting. Uh, 20 years in the Middle East has driven a lot of uh, developed practice rightly over a long period of time and we're now pivoting to the Indo-Pacific uh, in a way that we couldn't have imagined five years ago. So uh, that, that will take some time to to refocus, but uh, people understand the reality and we're dealing with that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis now. Uh, it, it's worth reminding the audience, Peter, that you have been on the National Security Committee of Cabinet for some some six years, so that these issues are not, are not new to you. Um, overnight, we had the Prime Minister in, in the West uh, before he, he um, got on his flight to Singapore and then the G7 um, talk about um, the increasing imperative of the democracies to get together uh, to uh, present a sort of a joint response. Is that, in your view, the story we, we are talking about here at the Broadest? It's the democracies versus a new threat from authoritarian regimes. But I, I think that's uh, right. And I think if you look at the engagement now from European partners, uh, NATO, uh, Maurice and I had a two plus two with Japan yesterday. Uh, they are very clearly focused on the reality in their own waters and what they're dealing with. There is the sharpened focus, obviously, of France and Germany, uh, but others in Europe as well, who are looking to the region. The Canadians have their own experience and uh, obviously the Five Eyes partners have an acute awareness of what's going on in the region, the Quad partners, uh, India are an incredibly important partner uh, as you know, the truly democratic nation that sees uh, the reality of author authoritarian, uh, a push away from democracy into a different type of government. So uh, I, I, I think there is an awakening and I think that's important because the process of deterrence, the ability for us uh, to reassert what in many people's minds uh, is a given that will never change. I think it is important for us to renew the debate about uh, the virtues of uh, democracy, freedom of speech uh, and the other values that we adhere to. And I think it is important for like-minded countries to step up and I think we're in that process now. I mean, the sense is now that Australia is not alone. Uh, there, there might have been a few months back in the last 18 months or so where it felt a bit that way. Do, do you think we um, perhaps underinvested in some of those traditional European relationships uh, that we, we needed to do more and, and now are doing more in those democratic connections? That's a, a good question. I mean, it's we have wonderful partnerships with uh, you know companies who are represented here today, nations who are represented here today uh, from the continent. We've got uh, partners in Southeast Asia uh, around the world that, that we have invested in. Uh, but the tyranny of distance means that it is difficult to maintain uh, those natural relationships and, and the focus on the Five Eyes partnership, particularly uh, having spent the last 20 years you know, in close quarters with them, 
I, I think it is appropriate that we refocus. And one of the upsides, uh, and there aren't many, but one of the upsides of COVID has been, you know, the ability to have that virtual conversation, whereas 18 months ago it would have been offensive to suggest that you weren't available for an in-person meeting and it didn't take place, uh, or not to the extent that it, that it currently does. So I think there are a number of, of uh, ways that, that you can look at it. But I think quite apart from our engagement, uh, you know, those countries, their leaders, uh, their defence uh, sector, they're, they're reading the same intelligence that we are and they understand what is happening within the region. They have their own connections with PNG or Fiji or the Solomon Islands and others uh, close by uh, as much as they do with us. And they uh, no doubt have a number of sources and their own understanding of uh, the coercion and uh, the, the interference that uh, is taking place. Mm. Uh, well, Peter, language is important. Um, mm. But we're 18 minutes in and you've not mentioned the China word. Um, what, I think what, I did on my speech. <laughs> well, perhaps five minutes into our conversation. Um, what, what's the, in, in your mind, what, what is the, the type of relationship that you would aspire for for, for us to have with, with the PRC? Well, I, I don't think it's a, a complicated uh, question or, or response, to be honest. We have a very deep and abiding trading relationship with China. We have a respectful uh, relationship uh, with China from our own perspective. We are a peaceful nation. We seek uh, to support our neighbours, particularly in time of need, and we have a need for that in response. And uh, it, it's not more complicated than that in my mind. We aren't going to have the military uh, ties with China that we do with historical partners like the United States or the United Kingdom. And uh, that, that no doubt is an issue for China, but that, that is the reality of our position and our history. Uh, and it will be the reality of our future as well. So we, we seek to have a productive relationship with China, but we don't accept uh, breaking of the law. We don't accept interference in our electoral process. We don't accept uh, interference uh, in processes of democracy otherwise, and uh, we, we crave a peaceful uh, region, and that's what we will continue to work toward. Thank you. Peter, I'd like to, if I may, get into some equipment uh, uh, and acquisition issues. Uh, it, it does seem clear now that the government is uh, giving itself scope to look for perhaps alternate solutions to the future submarine program. Can, can you share with us what uh, the thinking is, what, what the sort of uh, plan is that you're formulating for how we might uh, deal with that uh, particular acquisition going forward? Not really. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, it's kind of you to ask, but <laughs> the... I had to try. Yes, of course. Uh, look, I mean, we, we have seen, I think, quite a development in uh, the approach of Naval Group over the course of the last few months. I think there were real problems uh, which are well documented last year. I think there were questions about capacity and questions about some of the information that we were receiving and how reliable that might be. Uh, I think with the personnel changes, you know, the appointment of quality people like David Peaver and others uh, shows a genuine effort to try and get the program back on track. Uh, as I pointed out in, in my uh, scripted remarks, there, there is uh, a need for an island nation like ours to make sure that we have capacity uh, under the water for a number of reasons. And uh, we need to make sure in, in any of these acquisition programs that people where there is a contract in place, the conditions need to be met. Uh, we need to have assurances around cost and around delivery time schedules. And uh, that's what we're working towards. So, um, so I, I think there have been genuine efforts made uh, by Navarre Group, but, but also by Defence as well. There's uh, you know, that there are process issues on both sides of the fence, to be fair, and uh, we need to make sure that we assess, uh, which we are doing at the moment, uh, what our needs are over the course of uh, the coming decades and need to make sure that we're, we're fit for purpose. And that's, that's the process we're in now. 
And uh, what's your thinking about Colin's uh, life of type uh, upgrade? Because clearly, whatever happens with the future submarine uh, program, Collins is going to be the significant uh, end of deterrent capability for at least a decade and more. Yes, yeah, and I mean, look, I, I think given the history of Collins, the, the very early years, people are surprised to hear that Collins is a very effective, uh, you know, strategically important asset for us. Mm. Uh, we do have an edge within the region, I, I, I believe, and that's the advice that I receive. Uh, there is a, an enormous amount of capacity. Uh, but the, the first Collins uh, uh, is coming to end of life in 2026, and the life, life type extension would mean uh, that uh, that vessel would be pushed out uh, to 2038, potentially, and then a two-year rolling program beyond that for the others. Uh, if that's uh, if that's the step we take, so I, I've said publicly before that um, that 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 is an important program for us, and uh, we just need to work um, on how that is shaped and how we can have the most efficient delivery of that uh, that program. But we're we're working on that at the moment. I guess the strategic issue here is that uh, people perceive a gap. I, I don't think it can be described in any other way between the the long term acquisition of key capability, which will start to manifest itself in, in the 2030s uh, with uh, what, on the other hand, is clearly a significant um, uh, uh, worsening of our short-term strategic situation. Uh, I mean, how do you as Minister think about managing that challenge? And, and I guess what it boils down to is also how do we get more capability more quickly into the, into the ADF? Well, as, as Brendan and Stephen appreciate, uh, the, the real joy of this job is that uh, I get to deliver programs, decisions that were made one and two and three predecessors ago. Six predecessors. Uh, six predecessors ago. And uh, the joy is that I can bequeath the same sort of decision-making <laughs> process to my successors yeah. Yeah. Uh, in years to come when I'm sitting on a beach somewhere. I'll <laughs> look on with amusement. Uh, so I think the, the job for me is to uh, accept that, yes, I mean, there, there were... We went through a period where there was no investment and priorities for some reason were elsewhere and there wasn't the foresight to understand or to predict where we are today or where we might be in a decade or two. So I, I can't change that. I need to, uh, to deal with it and we're in the process of dealing with it and the programs that we do have underway, um, we need to make sure that uh, there is a realignment of thinking with some of our partners about uh, a sharper focus that we will be taking to the negotiating table and expectation around delivery. Uh, and we want long-term relationships, but uh, we want value for the Australian taxpayer. But uh, above anything else, I want capacity uh, for the Australian Defence Force to be able to deploy uh, at a time of need. So where there is a gap that exists for whatever reason, uh, we need to be able to retrofit that as best we can. Mm. Uh, turning to the alliance relationship... Brendan only made good decisions in his time, so... Not, uh, <laughs> I, I hasten to add. I... He told us that this morning. Yes, uh, yeah, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, turning to the, the, uh, the US alliance. So, ANZUS is 70. Uh, I, I said to the audience earlier today, the history of alliances is, is in fact, that they're much shorter-lived than that. In, in general... Uh, over centuries, the average life of an alliance is less than 40 years. And here we are, 70, uh, and still pretty vital and, and going strong. What, what's your agenda for uh, alliance cooperation going forward, G given that in the 70th year, with the possibility of a presidential visit, the, these things can, you know, kick along new avenues of cooperation? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think you'll see in Cornwall uh, over the next few days, Prime Minister's engagement with uh, President Biden as well as Prime Minister Johnson as well. And uh, there will be a focus on the Indo-Pacific. I mean, they are, they are engaged, they understand. Uh, the United States, to the credit of President Biden, uh, has continued that interest and uh, understands what is going on. So there will clearly be a focus on uh, that aspect of the relationship. Uh, so we need to deepen that. And we can do that perhaps through investment uh, in each other's programs, uh, a deeper engagement with personnel, 
there's clearly the opportunity for Australia to, uh, to do more given our geographic location in terms of troop movements, etc. Uh, uh, visits, the Germans, the, uh, the Brits, you know, the Japanese, others uh, are all keen, as I said before, in the Indo-Pacific space. So the United States uh, will and must always be our most important strategic and military partner. That, that, that is reinforced this year again. Uh, and even in some of the early discussions I've had with Secretary Austin and, and others within the administration, uh, there is just no quibble about that. Mm -hmm. And I know we always say we don't take it for granted and we don't think it can get any better than what it has been and it survives, uh, but, but there is a genuine refocus now. And I, I think the times uh, just make that a reality. So, so it's important for that to continue. And there will be hopefully a presidential visit or uh, other ways in which we can celebrate. Uh, we've got Osmin later this, this year as well, uh, that we can celebrate that, that relationship. But importantly, I think the quad now, in terms of our alliances otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, the quad between India and Japan is a very significant step. And uh, again, they have a realistic outlook on the region and the way in which uh, they look to Australia, as we do to Japan in our discussions yesterday. yesterday um, uh, there is a respective view that, uh, that, that people need to stand up yeah. and that's what we're doing. And beyond that, uh, ASEAN is, is incredibly important. I, I know there's some attempts to undermine uh, the legitimacy of the Quad by, uh, you know, some, some uh, players and, and saying that that's a distraction from ASEAN or it's to usurp that process, uh, it, it, clearly it's not. Uh, ASEAN remains an important process and uh, we, we need to make sure that uh, in, with our near neighbours that we continue uh, the engagement and the conversation with them as well. Now, Peter, a, a topic close to my own heart and indeed I'll take my glasses off to ask this one. You, you, you've asked Defence to provide you with fresh advice on the Port of Darwin issue. What's your thinking there? Well, my thinking is that uh, when the decision was made uh, in 2015, the, the circumstances were very different than they are in 2021. And I've asked Defence to, to look afresh at uh, the arrangement there, what a continuation of that arrangement uh, uh, might mean, not just in 2021, but uh, over the next five or 10 or 15 years. And they're coming back with that advice. So I, I won't preempt what that advice uh, might be, but uh, they'll come back and I'll take that to, uh, to a decision at that point. Do you, do you anticipate that there's scope, scope for more Marines in the North, um, US naval vessels operating out of Stirling? Yes, I do. More yes. pre-positioning of equipment? Yes. You think that's a, a potential sort of further step in terms of... I, I think that is in our in our own security interest, and I think it's uh, in the interest of the United States as well. I think uh, concentrating assets in, you know, particular locations, uh, you know, has a long history of, of good and bad outcome, and I would have thought uh, that the United States, uh, you know, would be giving consideration to that. I think the, uh, the uh, charge d'affaires at the moment uh, has outlined his thinking on, on that recently as well, and uh, I suspect that's the thinking of the administration without speaking for them, but uh, I mean, it's not, um, not something we've, hide, we, we've hid from the public. I mean, we've been very clear uh, and, you know, to the credit of the Gillard government, uh, others, uh, there has been a long-term strategic thinking along those lines, and uh, I, I would certainly encourage that. So on, on another topic, uh, uh, Peter, you've, you've been pretty insistent in, in your public messaging to the defence organisation that, that their task is to get back to a focus on core business. Uh, and we have the vice chief in, in the audience and we have the associate secretary in the audience here. I, I guess they knew that message already, but a lot of defence folk here. What's your message for them? Well, my, my message is that we've gone through a difficult period with Brereton and we've gone through a particularly long campaign in the Middle East. And we lost 41 people in that Middle Eastern campaign. We've had over 500 people who have committed suicide since uh, people have come back to uh, their home. And uh, we're not getting that right. 
And I think there has been a morale issue which we need to address. Uh, we're clearly not getting it right in terms of taking care of our own people when you see those numbers. Uh, and I think both for serving personnel and for those who have separated from the organisation, it's an incredibly important message for them to hear uh, that we want to support them both in their term of service and post uh, their period with defence. And so I think there needs to be a refocusing of that message. And I've tried to convey that uh, in base visits and where I've met with uh, personnel otherwise. And I've made it very uh, clear to the Secretary and the CDF and, and, and the vices and, and the, uh, uh, you know, the senior leadership group otherwise. And uh, I, I think that's important. I don't want us to forget the lessons of Brereton, but equally, we're not going to be mired in it. 80% uh, of those who are in the SAS at the moment have never been to Afghanistan. Mm. And I need the SAS to be as sharp over the course of the next 10 years and beyond, uh, as sharp as they've ever been before. And their ability to uh, provide um, an outcome for us uh, is incredibly important. So I want to make sure that we can reduce the number of separations or people leaving special forces. Uh, I want it to be an attractive place for people to go. Uh, I, want to know, I want to know that people on the front line are being heard by those in Canberra and we're embarking on that course. So uh, when I say that, that I want to have the back of those men and women, I genuinely say that uh, and I'm going to, to deliver on it. And uh, the, the leadership group understands that and there are some changes that we've made already to, to bring that into effect. Uh, my, my last question before I go to the audience is actually a question about you. Um, as, uh, as Chris said, you've, you've now been in Parliament for 20 years. Uh, you've, you've had 15 years or thereabouts as being a senior minister. Uh, and now you've entered a portfolio where the, uh, over the last decade and a half, the average life of a defence minister is less than 18 months. Um, What's the secret to senior ministerial longevity, Peter? <laughs> uh, well, it's really a question for the Prime Minister, I think, more than, <laughs> more than it is me. Uh, look, I have, uh, I've been very fortunate over the course of the last 20 years. I've uh, served uh, under some great leaders and uh, I've been fortunate to be on the front bench in opposition or in government uh, since 2004 uh, in a number of portfolios and uh, I, I just see no greater honour than serving in this portfolio. I take it very seriously. I think the time uh, is a very serious time as well and I think it's important for, uh, for us to get the decisions of today right. Um, I've alluded to some of the mistakes that have been made in the past. So. Uh, for, for me, um, the secret to longevity, I suppose, is getting all of that right and uh, ultimately you're in the hands of the leader, but uh, it depends on the outcome of the next election, which is due next year, and what happens beyond that. But I'm, uh, despite my appearance, uh, only 50 years of age, so I've still got uh, a couple of years left in me yet, and uh, I'd like to be around in this portfolio for a period of time because uh, I think you need to be able to you know, make decisions, make sure that they're carried, carried out. Uh, I, I mean, I have some of the best, most competent, uh, able public servants from the CDF and Secretary down. Um, but, you know, the, this is not a comment directed at them, but my experience of the last 20 years has been that sometimes uh, public servants and current company excluded, I'm sure, uh, do try and resist on occasion the will of ministers. Never in uh, my day. Uh, no, it's uh, it? a passing inconvenience, I think, is, uh, is how sometimes we're described. But uh, so I, I think that longevity is good if you want to, to implement the plan or the vision that you've got for the organisation. And uh, for that reason, I, I intend to stick around for a while. Yeah. One of the things I've done this year, Peter, which has really been very interesting, I've, I've interviewed 12 of your predecessors right. for a book that uh, we're producing. Uh, at Aspia on uh, what, what's it like to be a defence minister. And, and one of the um, interesting things that's come up in, in, in more than a few conversations is about sleep. How much sleep do you need to be fully functioning and effective as a minister? Uh, good question. I, well, my routine 
in Canberra is I normally get up at about uh, quarter to five or so, so I'll go to the gym then and then into the office. Uh, I find the only time... I, I'm, my other role is as leader of the house, which is a huge mm. distraction during sitting week because you're dealing with every uh, dear colleague who doesn't want to turn up to a division or has a better idea for a division, uh, a better policy idea than the government's come up with, etc. So <laughs> there's a lot of management through that process. Uh, but I think sort of after hours or on the weekend is probably when you can get some thinking time, which is yeah. important. Yeah. Uh, I've, you know, um, spoken publicly about it before. Uh, I've taken up meditation over the course of the last few years uh, through a mate of mine who was very successful in AFL in Victoria. And I find that that clears the mind, uh, that allows you to sort of do a double shift because you're not leaving, mm. you're, not, you're not in bed before... 11 o'clock or, you know, if you've had a dinner and you've still got something to do afterwards. So um, so I, I can cope pretty easily on, on four or five hours. Right. Um, but, you know, if I had my choice, I was sitting on a beach somewhere, I'd probably wake up a lot, a lot longer. I just think your body gets into that routine. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that's fascinating. Well, we have time now, uh, sort of eight or ten minutes or so for, for questions. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Stephen loosely, then I'm going to go to the, the press call down the back, uh, Minister, if that's OK. But, uh, Stephen, can I go to you first? Uh, thanks, Peter. I wanted to focus on the concept and reality of democracy and friends. Uh, one country we haven't mentioned as yet, which I think we'd all agree is very significant, is Indonesia. And I was just wondering if you'd like to offer some thoughts on how you see the security cooperation and relationship with Indonesia evolving during the course of this decade? Uh, th thanks, Stephen. Uh, well, first, I see it as first class. Uh, I've had the benefit of uh, dealing closely with uh, the Indonesians over, over a period of time, particularly in home affairs. So the, you know, the, the, the respect uh, from Indonesia, uh, you know, back into our system and the government... Uh, uh, from the Prime Minister-President relationship down, uh, I, I think is quite remarkable and very important, as you point out, uh, incredibly important strategic partner going forward. And, you know, they have their own view in relation to uh, what's happening in the Indo-Pacific and uh, they're a very important partner for us going forward. So I think a, a continued engagement, obviously there's been some discussion about uh, a further investment that they'll make into their own defence capacity, particularly following uh, the tragedy of uh, the submarine that they lost and uh, the men on, on board that. So there will be uh, a continued engagement and, and a maintenance of, uh, of that relationship, a, a deepening where it's necessary, but I, I, I would describe it really at the moment as, as first rate and necessarily so. Excellent, thank you. Can we do uh, Ben, uh, Andrew Green first, then Ben? Thank you. Uh, Minister Andrew Green from the ABC, I'll take you to your comments on the US Marines. Where, what could you see with the expansion of the Marine footprint? Could you ever envisage a joint brigade, some sort of semi-permanent uh, base, for want of a better word? And similarly with HMAS Sterling, it's always been a red line, foreign bases, but could we see something in that direction with the US? Well, Andrew, I, I think in terms of uh, the composition numbers, uh, what it might look like, uh, I'll leave that for another day, but there, there is a, a desire by us to see a further strengthening of that relationship and that engagement. We've been very clear about the $8 billion that we're investing across the north of Australia. There's a very significant investment into facilities, into our capacity to train jointly with the Americans and others, and that will uh, continue unabated. So uh, we'll, we'll have those discussions with, with the United States, uh, but there's a clear desire for us uh, to continue to, to, to strengthen that program and we'll look at ways in which we can do that. Minister Ben Tuckham uh, from The Australian. Um, on the, um, uh, the issue of strategic warning time, um, obviously that's, um, there's an acknowledgement that that's been significantly compressed, um, which, um, which uh, leads us to um, needing more immediate capability 
upgrades. Um, logic suggests that um, this will leave us fighting, uh, you know, a, a war if it occurs in the next 10 years or so with the capabilities that we already have largely. Um, the Collins, the Anzacs, the AWDs uh, and so forth. And I'm just um, hoping you could give us some insights into your thinking on, um, on how uh, we can improve and upgrade those capabilities um, in, in the short term, short to medium term, um, such that we would have a much more um, capable force. Uh, well, well, a couple of points, Ben. I mean, firstly, I wouldn't underestimate uh, the capacity that, that we have now and the deterrence value of that capacity uh, that we currently have in addition to uh, the acquisition program that we have in place uh, should be a very strong message to any adversary or potential adversary. Uh, it, it also is the reality that our engagement with uh, the United States with the partners that I spoke about before uh, is heading in one direction uh, which enhances Australia's overall capability and, and capacity to respond. Uh, we're very interested, uh, concerned about supply chain surety as well. Uh, all of that is an important part of uh, us making sure we're in a very strong position and we work very closely with our industry partners uh, who I know have a close eye uh, on that element of their business delivery to defence and uh, increasingly that's of greater interest to, to defence acquisition as well. So there's, uh, you know, th there, there are many elements that I can point you to uh, that I think provide uh, a deterrence effect and I, th I think that is a very important message for us to project and where we have the ability to bring capability on sooner uh, in a meaningful way and where we can deliver that to, uh, you know, according to our, our stated principles, then we'll do that. Um, but I wouldn't underestimate the capacity of the Collins class, for example, and um, we're making an investment uh, in that as we spoke uh, of before. Well, Peter, we have about two minutes, so I'm going to go for two quick questions. There was a hand in the second row of tables wave waving over there and then a person at, uh, at Gordon's... Uh, 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 table. So please, over, over here first to the right. Uh, g'day. Uh, Christine Lear, Contestability Division. Um, so I'm, I have a question about how serious Australia is about the concept of deterrence. Um, we've had our VCDF talk about uh, area denial, but historically deterrence by denial doesn't work. And I think that's going to be especially difficult in Asian maritime theatre. So I'm curious how you think about the sort of delineation between deterrence by denial and deterrence by punishment. Thanks. Well, I think if you have a look at uh, what we've had to say uh, about our investment and, and the breakup of that investment uh, uh, over the course of this decade, a very significant investment into uh, space, for example, uh, and an enormous capacity already with our partners uh, in that area, um, one that's you know, not, not in the papers each day, but uh, that, that you would have an aware, awareness of, uh, as others would, uh, there is uh, a significant capacity that we have through uh, our partners and messages that, that, that we can convey, uh, consequences that, uh, that we can deliver. The cyber investment that, uh, that we've made uh, is obviously a new feature uh, in the whole discussion of deterrence as well. Our offensive capacity uh, the ability within ASD, uh, which is recognised by uh, our partners, uh, including the NSA. I mean, the capacity within the Australian Signals Directorate uh, is, is world class, without any doubt. And I was down at ASD uh, only a week or two ago and looking at some of the programs that they're involved in, um, our adversaries would want to think twice about unleashing some of their capacity. So, uh, so I, I think there are many elements that... Uh, are part of an overt mission and those that aren't. And we continue to work away on both. Thank you. And last question, James? Is, yeah, James Brown. Uh, Minister James Brown from the Aspie Council. Uh, firstly, thank you for your comments on Lost the issue your beer, of... James. I've, <laughs> I've only seen you through Skype uh, in recent times. So. <laughs> uh, 
Um, thank you for your uh, comments on um, the veteran suicide issue and transition. I think it's really important to hear a defence minister acknowledge that in such an upfront way. Um, my question is about your thinking on defence's investment in space capability, both from a deterrence and military response point of view. Um, given the size of the investment that defence is making in the coming years and the kind of criticality of those capabilities, do you think there's a need for space to become a, um, a sovereign industry capability priority? Uh, again, a, a good question, but just to deal with the first part, uh, uh, thank you for, for the work that, uh, that, that you do within uh, the RSL and elsewhere and many in this audience, uh, including in industry, who take uh, the responsibility very seriously in terms of engagement to employment of our Defence Force personnel uh, once they've retired or, or, or left the organisation. Uh, there's an enormous investment that we'll continue to make uh, which is veteran-led and, uh, and many organisations that we're working with to, uh, to really make sure that we can improve uh, that outcome. And, and as I said before, I'm determined that we will do that. Uh, in relation to space, again, uh, we, we've, we've signalled our, uh, our intent. We have supported uh, a number of programs, uh, the science and technology uh, space, the, the companies, small companies that we've supported uh, domestically, the capacity that they've built, the uh, programs that, they, that they've now got underway, uh, there, there is enormous opportunity uh, within uh, what's uh, you know, an early stage uh, in many respects industry. But again, the, the engagement with the United States uh, is, is quite phenomenal and uh, there will be the ability for Australian companies to, to develop sovereign capacity here through our investment, uh, our support of, uh, of new and emerging technologies will continue to do that. So uh, I, I think it's one of the most prospective areas uh, of engagement, investment and, and opportunity, strategic opportunity for us and, uh, and clearly, you know, the CDF and the Secretary are, are of the same view. Well, Peter, th thank you so much for this. It's been, uh, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure uh, and a privilege to, to have you as, as direct uh, as you have been, um, as frank and uh, as good humoured, actually. It's been a, a really enjoyable conversation. And can I say, everyone in this room um, wishes you nothing but absolute best wishes in, in the endeavours because we all appreciate how important this is as a, as a national endeavour for the country. So, all, all strength to you. Can you please thank the Minister for Defence?